All righty. We are going to get started. Um, we've got some new slides and new information today. Um, so um, we're gonna really focus in on school reopenings. Um, so I wanna thank everybody for joining us, the changing COVID-19 and the impact on your life. Um, if you haven't been on this presentation before, um, I'm Dr. V, Dr. Val de Crowder. Been an emergency medicine physician now for 30 years and this is my fourth pandemic. Um, we have the information that's on these slides on the website, askdrv.us. Um, so all the original source information can be found there. So if you see something on a slide and you're like, I'd really like to have that document, feel free to go to our website, print it out. It's all on there. And then we're also on Twitter, askdr underscore v. All right, the structure of the webinar is gonna be 10 to 15 minutes of slides. We have more like 15 or 20 minutes today because of everything around school reopening, then followed by a question and answer. And we normally complete right at about um, 8.55 or nine o'clock. So all in total will be anywhere from 45 minutes to 60 minutes. Um, we take, everyone will be in listen mode. Um, you can ask a question either uh, at the chat icon, at the chat box, um, which is uh, shown here in red, or you can actually type a question in the Q&A. You can type in your questions in the chat box or in the Q&A as we're speaking. So you don't have to worry about if there's something, you know, having to remember something till the end of the presentation. Um, we will take the um, written questions in the Q&A in the chat box first. Um, and then if we're able to open up and go to live questions, then we will. The intention is to keep um, all uh, webinar participants informed about COVID-19 science to help you and your family stay healthy during this pandemic. Um, we've always said that the main thing in dealing with a pandemic is actually making sure that you stay healthy um, till there is an actual vaccine or treatment. The outcome of this webinar is that you'll leave the webinar motivated to create an action plan for yourself and your family. Um, you may also be motivated to create an action plan for your broader community. All right, so <clears throat> one of the most important things that's going on here in the United States is that the pandemic, because most of us have health insurance that are related to our job, we have 5.4 million Americans who've lost health insurance as a result of the pandemic. I think this is really important because whenever you have your health insurance tied to your job as opposed to tied to your body, um, you're at risk for actually losing it possibly at the time that you actually need it the most. Um, there are a lot of things that you see going on with um, the different hotspots that are developing in Los Angeles and Arizona and Texas um, and certain um, uh, counties uh, and states re-looking at shutting down. Um, I thought it was uh, very interesting on the 13th, Robert Redfield, who's the director of the CDC, said that if everyone wore a mask for six weeks, we could actually drive COVID-19 in the ground. And I think it's really, really important that the best way to actually get the economy back up is to actually get a handle on this infection through mask, mask wearing and social distancing. Um, there was another article that said U.S. could get coronavirus under control in one to two months if everyone actually wore a mask. Now, this gentleman here is a very interesting uh, person. Uh, he actually came out of retirement to help with the coronavirus. Um, his uh, his name is, I'm sorry, I get his name up, Peter Tsai out of uh, Taiwan. And he is the inventor and creator of the N95 mask. And so he is the one that actually holds the patent for this mask. So he actually gave what I think is the definitive information on um, what your mask plan should be. And these are basically his recommendations. He recommended purchasing seven N95 mask or KN95 mask, right? I looked these up today. This is the left one. You can get 20 um, on eBay for $12.99, and you can get 10 on Amazon for $2.99. So I looked these up today to see what the price was today, and there's availability today. So roughly you're talking about anywhere from a $15 to $30, $35 investment, okay? What he recommended was using one for each day of the week. Then when the day is done to actually hang it up um, on a hanger 
or in a bathroom. And he basically was stating that if it's if that if you use that mask on Monday, and then you're going to use that mask again the following Monday, that it sits there for a week, which is enough time to really allow any viruses to be deactivated. So then you don't actually have to get into it. And then obviously, as they wear out or wear down, you may need to get replacements. But he recommended cycling the N95 mask um, so that you're using one every seven days. All right, so a lot of us know the basics, but just in case, I'd always go over the fact that it's a droplet disease and it stays on uh, surfaces, uh, cardboard surfaces for 24 hours, plastic surfaces for 96 hours. There is some information now that we're also looking at the fact that there may be an airborne component to it, and I will actually speak to that as well. Um, it's highly contagious. Um, you only have to have um, exposure for 45 seconds to infect another person. One person in one infected person in 30 days will infect 402 people without wearing a mask and carrying on uh, as if it's normal, going to restaurants, bars, and sort of normal activity. Um, there's also pe percent penetration. Um, how many people out of 100 get the disease if they come in contact with it? Um, for COVID-19, it's, it's high. It's in the 70 to 80 percent range. Um, whereas, for instance, with influenza, it's right around uh, 30, 40 percent. Droplet versus airborne is something that you're hearing about a lot. Um, originally, when um, COVID-19 was discovered, it was, it was found to be a larger, uh, a larger um, uh, virus that um, was in droplets. Um, and droplets don't really fall that far from you. They fall about three feet from you. So if you remember, some of the initial recommendation was you only had to be three feet away. Now, they've, you know, now they're saying six feet or more. Um, and that's because there does seem to be an airborne component to it. So um, I just kind of want to show a couple of different examples. When we talk about a droplet disease, um, the ones that we really think about are Ebola, pertussis, and mumps. When you talk about an airborne disease, um, you're really talking about tuberculosis or measles. So in a diagram, if somebody coughed, if it was a droplet disease, as you can see, it would drop less than three feet, where something that is airborne may hang in the air um, way beyond six feet and also may hang in the air for um, three to five minutes after that person has left that area. So we don't know yet if it's a droplet disease that's spread by micro droplets that then act like they're airborne, or is it somehow or another that um, COVID-19 is becoming aerosolized either with heavy breathing or certain actions like playing instruments. Um, we know that it can become uh, airborne with the use of a nebulizer machine. Um, and we had spoken before on this presentation about how it's important to avoid a nebulizer at all, if at all possible, and instead to use an inhaler uh, with a spacer, which is shown here in the diagram to the right. Um, if you must use a nebulizer, you want it to be outside on a porch or a deck, or maybe in a garage with the garage door open, something like that, but you definitely don't wanna use it inside the home. We are not using them at all in the hospital. We're not using them in the emergency department. We're not using them in the ICU. Um, we're not using any um, nebulization um, because of the possibility that people could be COVID-19 positive and then aerosolize it. This is a study that's coming out in August. Um, this was one of the studies that actually um, led to uh, people thinking that this was airborne. Um, it was documented airborne transmission related to a fitness dance class um, where 112 people were actually um, infected during a 20 uh, during a 24 day period of time um, and this was aerosolation due to heavy breathing associated with the exercise and dance class. So aerosolation, it, it, aerosolation, the fact that it's airborne or has some components of being airborne is huge implications for indoor spaces um, and specifically indoor spaces um, that you stay in for a while. So that's movies, churches, gyms, office spaces, schools. Um, it is, uh, there was another study done which showed that they looked at air compressors and about, uh, and they swabbed the compressors and about a third of the air compressors actually had um, uh, COVID-19 RNA 
um, in the air compressors where the air is being recirculated. So indoor spaces are very, very, that's really, really where we want to really focus on, you know, do we really have to go into these spaces and how can we avoid them at all costs? So obviously a movie theater, very easy to avoid. Um, uh, I know a lot of people have uh, upgraded their Netflix, et cetera. Um, and so you can kind of watch a movie at home um, and the movie theaters um, for the most part on a lot of jurisdictions are shut down. Um, but there's some states where they are still open. Um, you wanna avoid a movie theater at all costs. Churches, similarly. Um, the singing, um, the uh, uh, call and response, um, and also the um, any sort of um, instruments that are being used that someone is blowing into. So um, some of the data on singing shows that the, um, the virus stays in the air for a very long time and travels very far with um, singing because of the for forceful blowing associated with it. So you really want to just, you know, a lot of churches have gone to Zoom. Some of them are doing drive-by church. Um, you want to look at alternatives like that. Now, gyms have also been found to be a pretty big um, source of infections. Um, and uh, a lot of this is related to um, not only the heavy breathing, but also, um, you know, people are sharing equipment, sharing space. This actually shows a couple of gyms and what they've decided to do. They've kind of put a plastic barrier up between the treadmills. Um, they've also created these plastic, almost boxes that you can then work out in. Um, I think that, you know, at this point there where with the summertime, there's a lot that we can do outdoors. Um, we can take those same weights um, outdoors. Um, you can walk on nature trails outdoors. So you really want to actually take your exercise outdoors if at all, if at all possible. Office spaces. Um, yeah, so the office spaces are also uh, things that you want to avoid. We did a, um, uh, we showed earlier a, uh, a simulation of someone coughing in the office. And essentially, um, it hangs in the air for roughly about six minutes or so. Um, I think it's really important. Um, office spaces will need to, you know, dramatically change their ventilation, um, specifically opening up windows, opening up doors, um, HEPA filters positive pressure ventilation, um, and we'll need to do a lot of things like that before they can actually be safe spaces for people to work. All right, now the main focus is schools. So um, I wanted to just kind of, um, you know, school reopenings are really gonna vary by location and what your actual infection rate is in your particular location. So if you look at states where there's a hot spot where, you know, Arizona, California, Florida, there has been no country in the world that has opened up schools with that type of community transmission, okay? So, um, and as an example, um, there was just an article recently, and I'll, I'm gonna try to show the uh, data at the very end, um, but uh, school children or children less than 18 years old that were um, uh, getting COVID tested in Florida, 31% of them were positive. So you can see how if you send kids to school and 31% of them are already positive, that that's really a, 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 a setup for a complete disaster. Um, and so that is really not gonna be possible. The other thing that you see is that in these, this picture here, the students are at a desk with a three-sided plastic barrier. I've seen where some schools are developing like a two-sided barrier. That is not as effective. So I'm gonna go over first the CDC guidelines. Um, and when I, uh, and I'll tell you some things in here that I think that are a little bit too weak and they need to be strengthened. So encourage students to stay at home when sick should be do not allow students, students to come to school when sick. Um, they need to do temperature testing and actually not allow the student to come if they're sick. Uh, clean and disinfect frequently. Uh, significantly monitor absenteeism, so you actually know when someone's actually out uh, and possibly might be COVID related, and then to actually have uh, some type of digital or distance learning. Um, so these, this is very bare bones from the CDC. 
What actually, uh, I think, did a more thorough evaluation was the American Academy of Pediatrics did a very, very thorough evaluation on this. Um, and again, this is on the website and, the, and the, the, this is on our website and then also the original source is sourced down here at the bottom. But specifically, they looked at education, nutrition, student with disabilities, special populations, annual school health requirements, athletics, uh, mental health, um, isolation, uh, uh, isolation measures, and group size. So let's go over some of the things that they said. So pre-K, what the, what, the uh, what the American Academy of Pediatrics did is they have high priority strategies and low priority strategies. I'm gonna just go over the high priority strategies because those I think are the most important. So for pre-K, um, they um, look to um, create sort of cohorts where you stay with that cohort throughout the day, right? So for instance, I may wind up, I go to school with that cohort, I go to lunch with that cohort, and I also go to out to play with that same cohort. And that cohort could be a group that is 10 to 15 uh, kids, right? And I don't mix with another cohort, right? The other thing they looked at in pre-K was utilizing outdoor spaces and limiting unnecessary visitors in the building. When you look at elementary school, um, they started looking at the, um, the children should wear face coverings um, when, um, when they, as long as they don't have a medical reason not to, um, and that the desks should be three to six feet apart when feasible, um, and also have the same concept of a cohort that is 10 to 15 kids that then follow each other um, throughout the day doing all activities together um, and not crossing contact between cohorts, um, and then also utilizing outdoor spaces whenever possible. Secondary school. Secondary school, um, they, um, uh, they also have the same thing, universal facial coverings, um, and um, they uh, also have everything around the desk being three to six uh, feet apart. Um, they also want to um, uh, have the students in cohorts. They particularly want to avoid singing and ex ex exercise. So things that produce increased exhalation. So choir practice would be a no. Um, any sort of team sports would be a no. Special education, basically this was a lot of writing, but what they basically said was special education needs to be determined on a case by case basis. Um, because some, some students that are in special education or have a disability um, may have other comorbidities or may have reasons um, where either the lack of socialization or the use of a mask may be prohibitive. So they really felt like for special education, it should be done on a case-by-case -case basis. Whoop. All righty. Um, so now, um, with, as far as riding on a bus, they really encourage that, um, that uh, the bus system um, uh, be minimized to only those students who have to use it and that really there, are, there should be alternative modes of transportation for the students. So whether or not their parents are bringing them or maybe two or three students are, um, are carpooling, um, that's basically, um, they really recommend it minimizing um, bus or transportation use. Then they also, um, again, stuck with this whole idea of cohorts, right? And assign the seats by cohorts. So if people are gonna be on the bus, they should be sitting with those same 10 people that they're going to be going through the rest of the day with um, and have um, tape that marks off where students should sit and where they can, cannot sit um, in order to maintain um, six feet distance uh, from each other. Um, they said to minimize the number of people on a bus, any adults who do not need to be on the bus should not be on the bus, and to keep the windows of the bus open as long as weather allows. Hallways. Um, hallways in the school that they, they um, recommend, and I've seen this in stores, where you'll have one hallway and it's a one directional hallway. So this hallway is going in one direction and another hallway is going in another direction. Um, again, using tape on the floors 
um, to um, keep the direction. And that, that limits people from bumping into each other if, if the direction is all in, in one direction. Um, they also looked at staggering the class periods, which we had talked about here, um, where you know possibly maybe students come in in a, in a particular cohort and they're in school from seven to 7 a.m. To, to noon, and then maybe another group is in school from one to 5 p.m. Um, assigning lockers by cohorts. So again, if I go to my locker, I'm still only around the people that are in my cohort, right? So um, they uh, talk here about um, playgrounds. Um, they, again, they said the emphasis is should be on playgrounds. Again, I'm going out to play with my particular cohort. Um, outdoor transmission for the virus is much, much lower than indoor transmission. So um, they felt that uh, limiting the size of the groups playing and limiting them to the cohort would really be sufficient and adequate. Meals and cafeteria. Um, so they, um, Serving meals is uh, an area where um, there's a lot of kids who get, the, get, their, get their meals from school um, and are part of a school lunch program um, and they get breakfast and lunch. Um, so this is really an important area. Um, again, they talk about having the kids getting their meals in the cohorts. So again, I'm not uh, if you're not in my cohort, then I'm really not seeing you at all during lunch period. Minimizing the amount of time that I'm actually in the lunch period, in, in the lunch, uh, in the lunch area or the cafeteria area. Um, utilizing outdoor spaces for kids to eat lunch at. Um, making sure that there's um, washing stations and hand sanitizing that occurs before and after eating. All right, so. So overall, the considerations for really going back to school should also really look at what is the infection rate in your community. Um, New York, the state of New York and uh, Maine and Rhode Island and Connecticut, the New England states have really done a good job around getting their infection rates down very low. So those schools may be able to have more in-person school. Um, but again, the community rate is, of infection is very, very important. If that community rate is high, um, and high is uh, basically if you're doing um, COVID testing and you're getting, you know, over 5%, uh, that's high. And as you'll see, Florida is in the 20, 30s, 30% range. Um, the age of the children is also important. Um, the, um, the, the data on whether or not um, the data on on kids giving it to each other versus giving it to adults. Um, most of what we've seen in schools, for the schools that have reopened in other countries, are adults, other teachers giving it to other teachers or kids giving it to teachers. Um, then you also have to consider, um, are the children a vector, right? So do they live in a multi-generational household? Will they bring it back to an elderly aunt or uncle or grandparent? So those are all things to kind of consider as you actually look at what to do for yourself and your family. So other countries have done most of the things that we actually talked about. Um, the countries have also given PPE to teachers and administrators and staff, and that's the private, the uh, personal protective equipment, um, the, the N95 mask, the gloves, the cleanser, the cleansers, the hand sanitizers, you know, again, these are all things that a school district now is going to have to take into consideration in their budget that they were not having to take into consideration previously. Um, and also more frequent cleaning of rooms and offices and buses and the things that were the things where people um, go. Um, they also need to have some universal temperature testing so they can make sure the students that are sick are not allowed in. All right, um, this is, um, I get a lot of questions about activities and which activities are high risk versus low risk. This is a COVID risk chart that was put together by the Texas Medical Association. This is also on the website. So if you wanna actually get this from the website, you can get this and print it out. But basically high risk activities would be large music concerts, religious events, uh, going to a bar, uh, going to a sports stadium. Um, also eating at a buffet, working out at a gym, going to an amusement park, which is interesting because as you all know, 
um, uh, Disney World uh, opened up or going to a movie theater. So those things are all eights and nines. Then lower than that is, um, is sending your kids to school or day camp, working in a, a week in an office building, swimming in a public pool, visiting an elderly relative or friend in their home, having dinner at someone else's house, attending a backyard barbecue, going to a beach or shopping at a mall. Now, as you get down to the fours, you're talking about things like sitting in a doctor's office, eating at a restaurant outside, uh, walking in a busy downtown area, spending an hour at a playground, staying two nights at a hotel. A little bit lower is grocery shopping. So grocery shopping is a three. Going for a walk or a run or a bike with others, playing golf. Um, two is um, going to a restaurant and getting takeout, pumping gas, playing tennis, or going camping. Um, and I think they put this in here just so that people would really understand what a one is. So if you open up your mail in your house, that's a one. <laughs> All right, so a little bit of COVID good news. Um, this is very, very important. Um, this is basically a, um, a home saliva coronavirus test. Um, these are now being tested and studied. Um, think of this almost like a home pregnancy test or maybe even checking your blood sugar at home, like a diet, similar to how a diabetic would do. And so the strip goes in there and you put some saliva. Some of them have, you know, you, some of them you're spitting into something, but you put your saliva there and it basically tells you if you're COVID uh, negative or positive. Um, and they're looking at using these strips so that people actually um, get the printout and then they get the printout and that then allows them maybe to go see a play that day or to go to the movies that day, et cetera. Um, so, and these, uh, these uh, rapid tests are, are cheap. They're in the, you know, I think they're in the, these, these kits are in the like five to $10 range. Um, and then you refill the strips. So it's very interesting to see what sort of innovation is coming out um, that possibly people may be able to do their own home COVID test whenever they want to and how, how, free, how however, at whatever frequency they would like to. Um, and that really would be, um, that really would be a game changer for this pandemic. All right, so I'm going to um, switch over now to Q&A. Um, actually, I wanted to show one thing real quickly before I did that because I had pulled up, this is, this is the state information for Florida. And I thought that this was actually really important because if you see here, these are all the counties and these are the tables showing the testing of Florida residents less than 18 years old. And this shows in the far right hand, the, um, on these two tables, the percent positive. So Alchoa County is 14.4, Baker is 12.9, Bay County is 35.5. And as you see, Lee County on the other side, 46.3. That means half the people tested less than 18 were actually coming back positive. So these numbers are very, very high. Um, and the regular adult population in Florida has a positive rate of 11% and less than 18 is having a positive rate of 31%. So that is what is happening there in uh, Florida. Alrighty, so I am going to um, stop the broadcast here and go back to uh, the Zoom and we can, uh, all right, wonderful. If you have any questions or you have anything that you'd um, like to ask, you can put it in the chat box. And um, hold on just a second. Uh, Ron, I'm gonna promote you to host so you can uh, pro promote you to panelists so you can help me with the, um, so you can help me with the chat box and the Q and A. All right, so. Do we have anybody that has any questions? You can also put your hand up if you want to be taken off mute and ask a question. We have enough people that we can actually take some folks off mute if people have a question that they want to ask. I am looking to see if there's any questions in the chat box 
Let me... Okay, there's one question. All right. All right. Um, Valerie would like to know, what is the difference between N95 masks with and without the respirators? Yeah, so the mask with the respirators that you see on the sides, those are actually what we call N100 masks. So when you see the respirators, the two respirators on the side, those are what we call N100 or respirator masks. Um, and they block out 100% of the particles, 100%. Um, so that is a, that's a, uh, a res like a respirator mask. So an N95 or KN95, both of which are the same, right? So an N95 or KN95, they block out 95% of the particles. So if you want to compare that to, let's say, for instance, just a regular surgical or medical mask, a regular surgical or medical mask might block out maybe 50%. Um, and then a bandana is almost useless. It's probably like maybe 20 or 30%. So it's all about the percentage of particles that it actually um, keeps uh, keeps blocked out. All right, looking in the chat box, um, there's a couple more questions. Okay, right. one from Linda. What would be, what would you recommend that an educator with an underlying medical condition do in school? Yeah, I don't, I, uh, I don't, I don't see, I don't see an educator with the underlying, I don't see educators being able to really go back if you're talking about areas where they have not gotten the infection rate down. So let me just say that again. So if I were an educator and I was in New York or uh, Maine or Connecticut or anywhere in the New England and I was healthy, um, then I would, um, I would consider, I would, I would go on back to work, um, again, with PPE and everything. Um, but if I had underlying health conditions, no, I would not. I wouldn't, I wouldn't go back to, back to work anywhere if I was an under, if I had a, um, if I was a teacher with underlying medical conditions. It's just too dangerous. All right. Um. Um, Valerie had another question. She said the N95 mask with the little square in the front and without the little square, with, with the little square in the front and without the little square in the front. Oh, 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 I know. Yes, oh, yes. So I, she's talking about the ones where it has a little thing where you can clip open. So there's not much difference to, between those two. If those are, those N95 masks still are, or sometimes they have that because it's a little bit easier to breathe and you can open it up and it makes it a little bit easier to breathe. But both of those masks um, with, with proper fitting, because most people don't have them properly fitted, but with proper fit testing, then those masks block out 95%, either one. So it doesn't, some people just breathe better in the one that has a little thing that they can open up in the front. All right, looking to see if, so far there's no other questions. Oh, another one just popped in. All right. Okay. Oh, this is a comment from Gary. Um, comments regarding types of masks. The side units are cartridges. The cartridges are, are color-coded according to what they filter out. Examples, black, fumes, purple slash magenta, particulates, AKA HEPA, higher filtration, yellow acid fumes. Thank you, Gary. He is our environmentalist in-house specialist. <laughs> 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 he is. <laughs> that's, that's good to know, safety engineer. Yeah. Okay. Yes, exactly. exactly. <laughs> so uh, another question uh, from Linda. Do you need FDA approved um, N95 masks? I guess because, you know, there was that talk about N95 versus K95. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, that's so um, 
the no, so that's a good question. I don't know if the FDA ever approved the KN95 mask. I don't believe they did. I believe the KN95 mask, so FDA approval is really only required for a hospital setting. They just wanna make sure that products that have been FDA approved are actually used in a hospital setting. But if you use an, an N95 or a KN95 mask that hasn't been FDA approved for regular use, you're, you would be fine. That's much, much better than using a, a surgical mask or a bandana or a scarf or anything like that. I'm kind of curious, what are, what are people planning to do with their children in September? Has anyone created a um, alternative plan? Oh, uh, just before somebody answered that, I actually had another question, which was, um, uh, okay, <laughs> which was um, someone wanted to know what is the damage from hospitals being told to bypass the CDC and instead actually report the coronavirus data to Health and Human Services? This is really, really, this is the most dangerous thing that is occurring right now. Do, do, you, do, you, want me, do you want me to chime in to give yourself a rest, Dr. Crowder? Yeah. <laughs> so the danger in that is that, you know, what, we're, what we worry about as healthcare professionals is that, um, that the data could be skewed and politicized. Um, as, you know, um, as healthcare providers and as um, I mean, in this, essentially we're scientists, we like objective data because it's only through objective data that we can provide the best advice. So that is really what a lot of um, physicians and public health um, officials are concerned about is that by shifting the information being done, um, provided to the CDC, um, to the CDC, which theoretically is more objective than HHS, which is, <clears throat> which has a cabinet appointment, um, we can get more objective data. So that's what our concerns. That's what our concerns are: is that we may not get accurate information to be able to provide the best information we can. And the, and the other thing is that they may also limit the type of data that they actually give out. Yes. So, you know, right now you're getting all sorts of data. We're getting, you know, um, 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 uh, positivity rate data. We're getting uh, information on how many ICU beds are available, um, death rates. They could decide that they're, you know, not going to report certain, certain data to the public. Um, yeah, no, it's very, very dangerous because um, uh, states will then have... Um, States will have, so I think what they've decided to do or what I've, what I've heard is a lot of hospitals are gonna report to their state and then the states are gonna report to HHS, but that still would allow the state then to report to the news or report to um, John Hopkins to maintain the John Hopkins map, right? So somebody wouldn't have to actually call, you know, 3,000 hospitals in the country, they would have to call 52 states every day to get the numbers. Um, so it is making it a little bit harder, um, but yeah, it's very, it's very dangerous. It's actually very dangerous, and especially with, with, with a president that we know is very focused on numbers and how numbers make him look, right? Mm -hmm. So it's actually really dangerous. Um, all right, I saw somebody put in the chat box that they're homeschooling their, they're homeschooling their kids. <laughs> And, and we have we have quite a few questions, um, Valda. Um, yes. One question um, from Leona is, what precautions to take in hair salon if hairstylist wears regular mask and does not wear the N95 slash KN95 mask? Yeah, so, so you know, I went and got my hair done and, and um, one of my, uh, one of my shampoo person had on a regular mask, but she also had on a face shield. Um, now, I wasn't sure what sort of mask my hairstylist was going to have, so I came with an N95 mask to give to her. Um, when I got there, she had already, um, she already had an N95 mask. So, um, uh, you know, I'm telling people, you know, is, you know, since you can now buy, you know, 20 of them, you can, you know, buy 20 
N95 mask for, you know, $30 or so, I'm telling people to really purchase them and actually, you know, if you're going to do something like get your hair done, you're not sure what that person has, bring them one just in case, right? Um, and make that a requirement for yourself. But I think it is important. I, I've really been encouraging everybody to upgrade to N95 masks. They're available now. Um, I know in my neighborhood, I have a little Korean market that's down the street. I can get them uh, whenever I want to. Um, can you reuse them was the next question. So there is a version of the N95 mask that um, can be used up to 20 times. Um, and it's about six or seven dollars um, and it can be used 20 times. And again, if you buy seven of them, then you can rotate them um, the way the inventor of the N95 mask suggested. I think that's a very good way of doing things. And Valda, I can also give the experience of, um, um, of my mom who's a senior and mm -hmm. um, going to the beauty shop. So um, her hairstylist who happens to be a friend of mine in their, in their shop, their, she purchased N95 masks and, has, and she has all her um, clients purchase one from her for $5. And then what she did was she keeps the mask. So when they come for their appointment, they may have on a regular mask when they come for their appointment, but she gives them the K. She meets them at the door with the K95 mask, and they have the K and they have the K95 or K95 mask in when they're coming mask. in. Well, right. are mm -hmm. they getting their head done? Right. Yeah. All right. Um, all right. Then there was a question about um, you want to read that one. It's kind of a lengthy one um, about dance classes. Yes. Um, um, would you give some insight on dance activities, classes, rehearsals, and performances outdoors? If following the social distancing protocol, sanitizing stations, and masks are dance activities recommended, dancers are essential workers due to, the, to mental and physical wellness. Home school. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, um, so dancing so again, as long as you're able to maintain the six feet dance, a six feet apart, right? Dancing outdoors would be okay. The audience would also need to be, the audience though should also be, you know, probably, you know, six feet or more from the stage, right? So if there's an audience, you want them to be sitting back from the stage. Um, and so if, but if you're able to actually do the performance outside, um, and if you're um, able to manage to do the social distancing and the sanitizing and mask, then you would be okay doing uh, the dance out, doing dance outside. Let me give an example for that because <clears throat> there's been a lot of uh, studies after the, the, um, the George Ford rallies. Now at the George Ford rallies, there was not a lot of social distancing. Um, and there was, but there were, there was, was I think fairly decent mask usage. Um, when I looked at the rallies, I saw usually at least uh, 50 to 65 or 70 percent of the folks had on masks. So we have not seen any real coronavirus outbreaks related to those um, to those rallies and to those um, to those um, uh, to those uh, uh, protests that were done. So that kind of gives you an idea of what happens in the out with outside. So, so Valda, I'm going to go back to the to the Q and A because there was a, there was a question. Um, what are your thoughts on the new reports about Florida that the COVID numbers are wrong and exaggerated? Yeah. So um, I I don't so so in general, every country has found that their COVID numbers were actually lower, not exaggerated in the high. So if someone suddenly dies let's say I suddenly die, I have heart disease, and I'm suddenly found dead, right? When you go back, a, a high percentage of those sudden deaths that you might have attributed to heart disease wound up actually being COVID deaths. So I don't think there's an exaggeration of the numbers. If anything, there might be an under-reporting of the numbers. Um, so what I'm actually seeing and what I'm actually seeing in Florida and the and the posit in the chart with the positivity rates that I'm that I that I was seeing um, I mean, those are the results from the actual test. So I don't think they're, I don't think they're exaggerated at all. If anything, I think they might be on the low side. What, that's what we found in New York. When we went back into New York and they looked at how many people actually developed antibodies, 
68% of certain communities had developed antibodies. They did not think that 68% of the people in those communities had actually gotten COVID-19, but they found out that they were exposed because they had antibodies. So usually what happens is it's more underreported than overreported. All right. Um, can, um, can you wash your N95 masks with soap and water? Um, I, so the, I wouldn't necessarily recommend it. So, so it's much better to sort of hang it and actually not use it for seven days, uh, like uh, Dr. Tsai recommended. Um, washing it is the one, so one thing about washing it, you can wash them with soap and water, but you really have to make sure they're completely dry before you actually use them again. So, because water will actually um, uh, make it so that it, it, it actually makes the contact surface are more likely to, to attract particles if it's not completely dry. So I believe that's probably why the um, inventor actually wanted people to just hang them for seven days and, and use them again after seven days. So I personally, rather than washing mine, I will spray mine with Clorox and so, then just let it sit, let it air dry. So Gary had another comment, which is, which is good. He said more about masks. The P100 tight fitting rubber seal will provide a protection factor of 50, 10 to 50. If you want to purchase a great mask, get a PAPR power air purified respirator. The breathing um, zone face covering that continuously blows positive air pressure through via filter cartridges. Now he said that he said that they're kind of pricey. He has three dollar signs. How much? Uh, roughly? Can you can you can you can you ask him roughly? Because I purchased a silicone uh, N100 respirator mask. Um, now mine was um, I think mine was like a hundred dollars. Um, what is pricey? I, I'm kind of curious as to what 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 he says. They're they're um, what are they going for? Because you can actually breathe better out of those masks. They protect you more, and it's easier to breathe in them. Um, he said, oh, he said the, uh, the Clean Space 2 PAPR half mask is $520. Yeah, yeah, so that's, that's, that's up a level there. All right. Uh, okay. Yep. We um, have some more questions. This is, we have some good questions this evening. I know, As, I know. Um, um, oh, um, Gary also commented that county, um, school counties in Georgia are releasing their separate plans. Cobb, Fulton, DeKalb counties, not Gwinnett, the largest, um, are distance learning for the first semester. Okay. Yeah. So, so then, uh, Manju asks, Manju asks, uh, excuse me if I mispronounce, um, what are your thoughts on the new reports that the COVID numbers, oh, I'm sorry, we already answered that. So okay. next is manicure, pedicure salons, um, equal mm. salon, are the protocols the same? Uh, no. So manicure and pedicure, the person that's working with you is often much, much closer to you. So what I've seen people use, and I, and I should maybe add a picture into the slide, is you know you sit and get your manicure done. That people actually there's a there's something like a plastic barrier that you then and you put your and it has a slot and you put your hands through. So your hands are over there with the with the manicurist, but there's a plastic barrier in between you, um, and that's what I've actually seen. Plus using obviously a mask. But that is actually what I've seen actually works for um, both manicure and pedicure to make sure that there's some sort of plastic barrier between you and the person who's actually um, doing, um, doing your nails, um, plus the mask. Um, and, 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 wait, and let me just say this, and with all of these establishments that you go to, whether or not it's hair, nails, doctor's appointments, whatever it may happen to be, the windows and doors of the establishment should be open, right? Do not go into a place where the windows and the doors are not open. Like my hair salon, the door is wide open, right? You want to be in an establishment. If you're going to be in an establishment, you must be in an establishment 
where the where air from outside is circulating is very, very important. Great. Yeah. Um, supposedly there are issues with tests performed by a lab based in Texas. Have you heard anything regarding that, um, Dr. Crowley? No, I have not. not. Not a specific, I mean, I've heard problems with testing <laughs> all over the place, but not a specific lab in Texas. No, I'm not, I'm not familiar with that. And um, how best can a person manage fear and or anger during this COVID-19 pandemic? This is an excellent question. Yeah. How to avoid feeling depressed and or overwhelmed, how to maintain or obtain some form of mental health during this COVID-19 situation. You know what, that's actually really important. And I'm gonna add, I'm, I'm going to add several, I'm gonna, you, she's actually making me think I'm gonna add some slides regarding that. So, um, so th there, there's, a, there's a couple of things. One is that, you know, you really have to look at what are the things that you really like to do, right? So I know for myself, I really enjoy playing tennis. Right. So I now have I'm playing more tennis than I've ever played right? probably in years. Right. Um, and so, you know, you really want to make sure that you um, you create the time to do the things that you actually enjoy doing. The other thing that I actually tell people is you want to make sure that you have some um, uh, you have a kind of like a routine such that you can actually, cause, cause there's also like people get very disjointed with the days. Like they don't know if it's Monday, Tuesday or Wednesday, right? So you really want to get up in the morning, orient yourself to what day it is um, and get into, um, get into some sort of a routine, right? Um, also look at some things that actually um, really help with, um, uh, changing things up a little bit. So for instance, what I did was I signed up for some of the food delivery services. So it would force me to actually uh, cook food that's different. You know, I normally, you know, if I eat just off of what I cook, I cook the same thing over and over again. Um, and then I'm not able to really go to a restaurant, you know, unless it has outdoor seating. And so I started ordering like a green chef or a blue apron or any of the food services, and, it, and that provided me some pleasure, right? So you have to really look at what are the things that you actually um, draw pleasure from and how can you incorporate that. The last thing that um, I've also talked with a lot of people about is um, making sure that you have different places to go in your home. So you're not working, you know, the dinner table sometimes has become now the work office and is also the dinner table. You know, you want to try to create, well, where's a separate space that I actually do my work? And then there's a separate space over here where I relax. Um, maybe um, some people are, you know, really fixing up their backyard. So they really have a place to relax in their backyard. So look at creating different spaces inside your home that you can kind of um, go to. Um, those things make a really big difference as far as your mental health. And, and I, can, I can just um, provide my own anecdotes. Um, I um, fix up my pat my both my front and back patios so I can have I can sit in the front or I can go in the back or I can be in the house. Um, in terms of exercising, I um, I walk. My goal is ten thousand steps a day. I try to go for my walk every day, or or I try to walk and ride my bike. Um, I try to do some 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 um, weights. Um, but I try to get out every day, and I it actually started that back at the beginning of the lock of the shutdown, yeah. and I was able to avoid the COVID fifteen. Oh, I'm glad you were. I don't know. I, I think I might have minimized it. Maybe mine is the COVID five. <laughs> <laughs> I actually lost fourteen pounds. Oh, okay, great, oh, yeah. great. <laughs> um, so yeah, yeah, we have um, there's um. One question, how, can, how do you make sure that your KN95 fits properly on your face? Ah, okay. So, okay, so there is a, um, so, okay, there is a fit testing procedure that is, um, uh, that is done in a hospital setting for hospital providers. Now, um, it, it's an apparatus that you actually get it and then you put it in and they pipe in various 
uh, things for you to smell. And if you can smell them, then it doesn't fit as well than if you can't smell it, right? So given that at home, we don't have any of those things, um, one of the things that we did earlier, and we could always do this again, but people can do this at home, you can get a couple of different N95 masks, right? And then what you can do is you can either, either spray perfume or you can use something like some off, like a bug spray, and see when do you smell it more or when do you smell it the least, right? So you don't wanna be able to smell something with this mask on or you don't wanna smell that much with the mask on. So um, that is how you would actually tell the difference between one that doesn't fit well and one that does fit well is basically if you can smell or not. Um, let me see. Oh, oh what? the best place that, wait, wait, the best place to buy them is eBay. I find that the best place to buy them is, yeah, I've seen the best prices on eBay. If you don't have them, if you don't, if you don't, if you're not someplace where you're seeing them at your local store, the best place to get them is eBay. All right, and I think we are at the nine o'clock hour, and that was yes. the last question. Oh, okay. oh, there was one one question. I'm sorry. What is the optimal blood level for vitamin D3 for the average adult? Oh, so um, I'm not sure about the blood level, but I do know that what you need for D3 is a minimum of 30 minutes walking in the sun three times a week. So 30 minutes walking in the sun three times a week will keep the average person's D3 level in a normal range. Okay. So, and then anything that you do over, over those 90, anything that you do over and above the 90 minutes is just great. But that's, that's a minimum requirement to keep it normal. All righty. All right. And uh, listen, if anyone, um, if anyone is interested and we do a lot to sort of uh, curate these slides and get the word out. And if anybody wants to sort of help and uh, be on the team, just email us and let us know and we'll reach out to you. Um, because this is really a, um, this is a community event. Um, and the goal is to get the information out to as many people as possible. All right. Well, thank you, Dr. Crowder, again, all right. for all the information. It's very timely and is excellent and you're providing a great service to the community during this. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye. Right. Everybody Bye -bye. stay safe. You too. Bye-bye.